Hey guys, this is Nick and this is your Linux, open source and privacy news fix for the end of March 2021. First, I wanted to tell you that the channel passed 100,000 subscribers today, so thank you to everyone. I'll be doing a Q&A slash what I use video to celebrate, so don't hesitate to ask your questions down there in the comments and I'll answer them in the next one. Now let's see what we have in store for this video. The release of GNOME 40, Starman returning to the Free Software Foundation and the uproar around it, and Microsoft may be buying Discord. Let's take a look right after this. This video is sponsored by Kernel Care Enterprise. Keeping servers safe, compliant, and ensuring constant uptime becomes a full-time job that has to be automated. To do that, you need a live patching tool that integrates with automation tools and vulnerability scanners, that is supported with the latest patches, that lets you decide what patches are rolled out across your organization, and that runs inside the firewall. Kernel Care Enterprise does all of this. It provides you with more integration, more support, and more control. It works in your local infrastructure via ePortal, a dedicated patch server that runs internally but outside your firewall. This server acts as a bridge between internal patch servers and the main kernel care patch server. This approach is ideal for staging and production environments that need strict isolation from external networks or require more stringent control over the patches to be applied. Try kernel care enterprise for free by clicking the link in the description below. Okay, let's start with the Linux news. Ubuntu published a much needed blog post explaining the rationale behind their full on support for Flutter. I won't try and go into detail about how Flutter works or what it does because I already proved that my grasp of this technology was feeble at best in the previous news video, but at least now we have some more explanations about why Ubuntu wants to promote Flutter that much. They also used a blog post to reassure about one of the main concerns, which is having the apps developed with Flutter look and feel like native apps. While they admit that performance won't be as good as with native libraries like GDK or Qt, they also point out the main advantage of Flutter, which is ensuring that your apps can be deployed to multiple platforms with virtually no code change. If, like me, you were skeptical about their move to Flutter for their own apps, you should take a look, it's an interesting read. GNOME 40 was released, and it's probably the biggest change to GNOME since GNOME 3. The whole activities view has been revamped with a more logical layout, displaying virtual desktops horizontally and putting the dock on the bottom where most people expect it. Many default apps now have rounded corners and the shell theme has received the same treatment. Default apps also have gained some nice features like autocomplete in the URL bar in Nautilus, more detailed map information on maps, or new tabs and experimental support for web extensions in GNOME Web. I have a dedicated video on the channel, check it out using the card up top. Ubuntu will implement desktop icons in a more feature-complete way in Ubuntu 20.04. They replaced the GNOME extension they were using with Desktop Icons NG, or DENG for short. This extension solves the biggest issue with the previous implementation, which is that you'll be able to drag and drop files from and to the desktop just like you'd expect. This had been a glaring omission from this implementation of desktop icons for a long time, well, now it's fixed. I still personally think that having icons on the desktop is just more clutter and it looks horrible and isn't more practical than opening a file manager window, but since people seem to enjoy having that feature available, well at least it will be in Ubuntu 21.04. It's too bad that they haven't implemented something more akin to KDE's folder view, which looks a lot better and is a lot more configurable. Most of you probably know about the Windows subsystem for Linux that lets you run Linux inside of a Windows terminal and use the Linux command line and even some graphical apps from inside Windows. Well, there is now a new project, just as badly named, called LSW for Linux subsystem for Windows. As its name doesn't clearly state, it lets you run Windows command line programs inside of a Linux terminal. The project is developed by Microsoft and will allow users to run PowerShell commands and every compatible Windows command line utility from the comfort of your Linux desktop. It has access to the underlying Linux file system and the devices connected to the computer. For now, only Windows 10 commands are supported, but Microsoft expects to expand support to Windows 8, 7 and even XP in the future. You can still use the link below to download the first version of the code, although you'll need a Microsoft account with a Windows 10 key associated with it to be able to use it. The first instance of the Elementary Developer Weekend will be held on the 26th and 27th of June 2021. This online conference, dedicated to the Elementary OS application developers, is the first of its kind, and it really signifies that Elementary OS has grown quite a lot in the past years. 
The team is now accepting papers for talks and ideas until the 20th of April. The format will be pre-recorded presentations streamed online to the audience with optional Q&As. It's nice to see my favorite distro growing and hosting its own developer conference, especially since the elementary OS specific apps have always been one of the major draw to use elementary OS. I'll definitely check the sessions out when they're live. Now on to the open source news. Wikipedia has launched a new service dedicated to companies called Wikimedia Enterprise. It's not yet available, but it could change how big tech uses Wikipedia. Most, if not all, big tech companies make use of a big, unwieldy Wikipedia data dump every two weeks. This system will still be available for free, as it is right now, but the new service should allow these big companies to get access to real-time updates and a more manageable format which should be easier to process and parse. Wikipedia will also offer phone support, guaranteed download speeds to grab all of this data, and a team of experts to help solve technical issues. I think it's only fair that Wikipedia makes big tech companies pay for access to the service, as it's one of the most important resources on the internet and it really needs funding. Let's hope that big tech will opt into the paid service, if only to support a volunteer-driven project that they've been using without charge for years. Now the elephant in the room, Richard Stallman announced his return to the Free Software Foundation Board of Directors. If you remember, he had resigned following a controversy over some comments he made about underage consent and statutory rape, which were unsavory to say the least. Well, he just announced that he would come back, and that's, that's how it is, and I don't plan to resign a second time. This sounds like a mistake from the Free Software Foundation, which sends a mixed message with this reinstatement. Stallman might have spearheaded the Free Software movement, but that doesn't excuse his behavior and comments and lack of apology. You can be a great professional and have great ideas and also be a terrible human being and in that case you shouldn't get more screen time, power and recognition. Especially since Stallman's most recent contributions to helping free software grow were basically just pointing fingers at what wasn't free software and insisting on that GNU slash Linux meme. An open letter to push the Free Software Foundation to remove him was co-signed by people from Egalia, KDE, Debian, Ubuntu, Arch, Apache, Mozilla, Solus, OBS Studio, or Elementary OS and GNU. This open letter seems to have done its job as the Free Software Foundation announced some changes to the board, where all board members, including existing ones, will be nominated through a more transparent process. Some people will no doubt try to pass this all as cancel culture gone crazy, conveniently forgetting that cancel culture is just a coin term to brush away the consequences of being an absolute ass publicly. Personally, I'm glad that our community could mobilize in such a way as to hopefully remove Stallman and enact some change. If you still like Stallman and support him, that's your decision. I'm not judging anyone for it, but I'm pretty sure our community and free software in general will look a lot better if he has no part in it. There also seems to be a letter in support of Richard Stallman, which currently has more individual signatures than the one opposing him. I'd say numbers aren't everything though, as the letter opposing Stallman is also signed by many, many companies and entities that work and contribute to free software, which is not the case of the letter in support for him. Now, Google and Microsoft are trying to fix web browser compatibility issues. The effort is called Compat 2021 and it aims to solve the main pain points for developers like CSS Flexbox, CSS Grid or how 3D animations are rendered in the browsers. They are mainly going to work on Chromium's code since that's what both Google and Microsoft use for their browsers, but let's hope that these efforts are picked up by people involved with Gecko and WebKit so that Firefox and Safari are also on board with these changes. We definitely need these kind of efforts once in a while, as for example, Firefox has been left behind by developers because most people use Chrome or something based on Chromium, which leads to issues in Firefox with untested websites that don't completely work, which in turn leads to less people using Firefox. If these standardization efforts can land, maybe it will mean that less stuff will be broken in less used browsers. GNOME announced the creation of libadvita. This new library aims to decouple GDK GNOME and the Advaita look and feel. GDK traditionally was bundled with all the Advaita files, like the style sheet, but as GTK isn't used exclusively by GNOME, they decided to create a new library that implements this visual part. This could also prevent the proliferation of multiple complementary libraries that implement new widgets, like libdazzle or libhandy, which might re-implement various widgets that already exist somewhere else. 
libadvita will be implemented instead of libhandy and will be maintained by the libhandy developers, so no work is lost here. It will also have the advantage of letting GTK evolve at its own pace, as it needs new components, without necessarily being in sync with GNOME. It probably will have an impact on how themes are created and how they'll work, so we'll have to see how this evolves. The library isn't ready yet, but we should see its first introduction in GNOME 41. Now onto some gaming news. The Funkey S is a super small handheld running Linux and which will please a lot of retro gamers. Well, it would if it still had any stock left, as pre-orders have already been filled. It runs on a specifically built Linux distro built with build root, and it supports a ton of platforms, PlayStation 1, Game Gear, NES, Super NES, Game Boy, Classic Color and Advance, Master System, Mega Drive or Genesis, and a lot more. It's extremely small, as in it has a 1.5 inch screen and measures 4 cm by 4. Basically, it's something you can affix to your keys and play games on to pass the time, but it's probably not going to become your go-to handheld anytime soon. Wine 6.5 was released with an update to the version of OpenCL it supports, up to version 1.2, and more support for using the Internet Explorer compatibility modes in the Microsoft HTML library. 25 bugs were also fixed, including Jedi Knight Dark Forces 2, Outlaws, League of Legends, Steam, Dark Souls 2 Scholar of the First Sin, or Guild Wars 2. Now on hardware, we only have System76, which released a new version of their Pangolin laptop, running on a full AMD base. If you want to see more about how this thing looks and feel, you can probably watch my review of the Tuxedo Aura 15 in the card up top that I published at the end of February, as it uses the exact same chassis and specs. I found it to be a well-built laptop, with a bit of flex on the keyboard, but very solid and with a nice feeling. The latest Ryzen mobile chips are amazing and offer great battery life, with very good performance, including the ability to play games up to AAA titles at lower settings. Of course, System76 ships it with Pop! OS, and the pricing is different, starting at $849, when the Aura 15 starts at €754. Euros. So if Tuxedo delivers to where you live, you might prefer the Aura 15, which will be a bit cheaper once you factor in the taxes. It's all a matter of which hardware manufacturer you prefer. And to conclude this video, let's go on with the application news. Firefox 87 will make more efforts towards privacy by trimming down the HTTP referrers being sent to the websites you visit. These referrers are generally sent to a website to inform it of where you're coming from. For example, if you visit DuckDuckGo and then Ubuntu's website, Ubuntu servers will receive an HTTP header telling them that you are coming from DuckDuckGo. The contents of these were left to the discretion of the website sending them, which means that they could include sensible information. Firefox 87 will now trim these headers by default to remove personal information. This means that all your requests and browsing will be more secure as a result, so it's a welcome change. You'll just get this improvement when you upgrade to Firefox 87, there is nothing special to do to enable it. And another big piece of news, Firefox might end up buying Discord for the hefty sum of 10 billion dollars. Now don't panic, this move probably has more to do with the fact that Microsoft wants to confirm its position as a major player on the gaming scene, which is one of Discord's main audience, than with trying to close it down for everyone except Windows and Xbox. Discord is already not open source, so there is no way they can close it down more, and since it's a web app, there is also no reason not to continue shipping a Linux client. Now, what might be a bit more scary is if Microsoft decides to add more data reporting to Discord. But then again, we don't really know what is already being sent to the Discord servers at the moment. Microsoft can sometimes mistake spyware for telemetry, so I wouldn't be surprised if at some point Discord sent them data about which games people are playing, how they're communicating and what topics interest people. We can probably expect an option to log in with a Microsoft account as well and default integration on Xbox, and in the future, probably the ability to use Xbox Cloud to join a game that somebody is streaming on Discord right from your browser or the Discord app. Apart from that, I'm pretty sure we won't have to shutter our Discord servers soon. I left a link to mine in the description of the video. And that's it for this video guys, I hope you enjoyed, and I hope you spotted the obvious April's Fools I stashed in there. If you enjoyed the video, you can like it or dislike it if you didn't. You can also subscribe and turn on notifications to get more videos like this one. If you'd prefer to watch somewhere else, you can also follow me on Odyssey, I'll leave the link in the description. 
And if you really want to help support the channel, you can join my amazing Patreon subscribers and YouTube members and get access to a weekly Patreon cast and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!